Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Julie Owono, and I'm honored, really, to moderate today's Dialogues and Debates uh, talk on Big Tech and Germany's upcoming election this September. Before I get started, uh, for more talks like this, please subscribe to the Most Fest newsletter, and all the details are on Mozilla's Twitter feed. Germany's election in just four months is the first federal election in a G7 country since the US sorry, election last year. All eyes are on the big tech platforms and what they will actually do and what their actions or lack of could mean for election integrity in other countries, especially since we've got some big elections coming up in the next couple of years. So that's what we're gonna talk about uh, today and uh, I'm so glad to be joined uh, for this discussion by Felix Carty. Hi, Felix. Uh, Felix, you are uh, from Reset, Germany, and you're based in Berlin. And today is your birthday. So happy birthday, and thanks for joining us on your special day. Thank you, Judy. Um, we also have Julia Reinhardt, uh, a Mozilla Fellow in Residence and a Tech Policy Consultant based in California and originally from Germany. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, Julie. And last but not least, we also have Amber Sina, uh, the Executive Director of the Center for Internet and Society, joining us today from India. Hi, Amber. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. I'm very excited to chat today, um, but one last thing before we uh, get started with the discussion, we are taking questions for the panel uh, in real time. So please don't hesitate to tweet them at Mozilla uh, with the hashtag, hash, <laughs> dialogues and debates, all plural. So uh, I think we can get started now. Uh, I, I, I guess probably one way to uh, start this discussion uh, as an introduction is probably to talk about what happened uh, in 2020 during the previous big uh, test, election test for tech platforms. And I wanted to ask panelists, was, what stood out uh, in your opinion from the US election last year? Was there anything that surprised you that the platforms did? I think, Julia, maybe I'll start with you since you're uh, in, in the US and you witnessed, witnessed it firsthand. Yeah, I mean, looking back even further, it's probably the, the the U.S. elections in 2016 that showed many insufficiencies and mistakes, and and from there to 2020 was already a huge learning process, not only on the part of institutions, of course, but also of platforms and, or maybe let's call it awareness raising process, because many platforms, above all Facebook, um, hadn't even realized or accepted accepted probably um, um, uh, before that they had a role in this. And um, we'll have a disc um, um, an opportunity to discuss this here today. Um, but like totally separately from that, what surprised me is not really linked to the content moderation or anti-hacking or any of those measures. Um, being, being here in the US and also observing uh, how elections function here, uh, it was really the minor detail that the United States Congress had earmarked such low funding necessary for election needs in this special in, um, situation, you know, the health, health concerns and the pandemic, the misinformation, the heightened security concerns, um, that uh, the election departments feared that they would not even be able to handle the elections the way they should. And then Facebook founder uh, makes Mark Zuckerberg, among, among other donors, of course, donated uh, $350 million to an impressive nonprofit uh, called Center for Tech and Civic Life uh, that then gave out um, grants to thousands of election departments on county and city levels across the United States. And that money was used to ensure uh, that polling stations were ready to administer and staff and monitor those election processes. So it's not really uh, Facebook acting this way. Uh, I'm not saying that it was the CEO as a donor. I don't want to claim this is not whitewashing. Of course, I mean probably it is, uh, but that was, you know, what surprised me most as a naive European is that he and other donors stepped up to this incredible challenge actually posed by the federal government, by the president himself, and that private money in that sense uh, saved the elections here last year. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree. Being based in the US too, that's something that really stood out to me. And also the exceptional level of coordination between the different companies in sending messages for people to go out to vote. So um, maybe I'll go ahead and, and ask Amber, uh, what surprised you in the last US election? Uh, uh, thanks, Julia. I mean, I think as uh, Julia was saying that the, the last five years have in fact been a kind of uh, fairly rapid process of, of just trying to wrap our heads around the ways in which social networking platforms are used during elections. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that stood out for me was this sort of gradual process uh, reversal of certain processes. I mean, so for a lot of platforms, and I think and Facebook in particular, this whole idea of, of creating a kind of well-oiled frictionless machine, uh, I think to, to a certain extent, they had to reverse that and, and kind of apply certain breaks. So a lot more kind of human intervention in a lot of decision making, uh, particularly making uh, so, you know, the entire process around political advertising, uh, adding a lot more steps, adding a lot more uh, human intervention in that. Uh, similarly for Twitter also, I think th the idea of kind of applying the brakes, slowing down information in certain sense, uh, also, you know, in, in certain cases, using the discretion to uh, negate the effects of recommendation al algorithms. So I think that to me was was quite interesting and, and surprising that uh, there is a particular kind of frictionless ideal that big tech companies, particularly social networking sites, have aspired to for the better part of the last decade or so. And uh, what the 2020 election demonstrated was that the only way they could control the flow of of extreme speech around election was to, to in some senses, uh, rethink that process, apply certain kind of breaks, apply friction to that uh, entire process. I mean, in terms of coordination, I, I felt uh, it was quite particularly in the run up to, to uh, particularly on election day and around results, there was a fair bit of coordination between a lot of actors. And what uh, surprised me was uh, that uh, I think social media platforms are also relying more on institutions outside of them. So, for instance, uh, a lot of it uh, in the US, uh, you know, because you have an institution like the Associated Press, uh, rather than trying to you know rely on their own internal mechanism, a lot of reliance was placed on existing traditional institutions. Uh, and that I thought was was quite interesting and and uh, a model that perhaps could be replicated in other places as well. Thank you, Amber. Uh, Felix, what, what surprised you in 2020 and tech election? I think, thank you, Julie. I think what surprised me most about the big platform's conduct was that a company as, as rich as affluent um, and as rich in expertise as well as Facebook uh, failed to foresee that uh, after years of, of unfettered, unmoderated disinformation campaigns, uh, conspiracy theories and hate speech on their services, uh, an entire segment of the population uh, could be incited to political violence and to try and overthrow the democratic system. I think um, the lack of, of, of clear sight and, and like, preventive strategies, risk mitigation strategies um, was extremely surprising, even especially because uh, obviously media scrutiny and public scrutiny isn't stronger anywhere ever than it is during a US election campaign. So that, uh, yeah, has me like draw the rather like damning conclusions for the rest of the world. Um, I, I completely agree uh, and it's, uh... It, it's like it, like I think we were saying when we were just discussing this panel. If you know, if things are not that well prepared for the U.S. or for Germany, imagine what it is for for other countries. Felix, uh, while we are at it, I think uh, we you're you're in Berlin, so maybe you could give us uh, a better vision of what the atmosphere is like. The election will be in, in September. It's going to be a big test, the next big test for the platforms. Um, also, uh, the incumbent. Angela Merkel is not running. 
So it seems like there could be a lot at stake. Could you please give us some context, what is currently happening uh, and share it with us? Thank you. So um, the political climate is very heated at the moment, also because of uh, everybody is drawn out by, by months and months of quarantine. We were a bit slower than our friends in the US in distributing the vaccine. So lockdown is really just being lifted. Everybody is tired. Um, it, I mean, this is obviously like a, a very fertile narrative for uh, right-wing populists to pick up to uh, to uh, to nourish and uh, promote all kinds of conspiracy theories uh, we have seen like trust levels in government and democratic uh, yeah institutions decline uh, consistently over the past months I think that's a little bit of, of a worrying uh, signal. At the same time, we have recently seen a polls uh, showcasing that uh, almost half of the German population uh, believe that the media systematically lied to them. I think those are very worrying figures <laughs> ahead of an election. On the other hand, uh, we should like uh, not like, yeah, not be too pessimistic because in Germany, as opposed to the US, we have very strong public service media, public broadcasters, uh, who I think are very strong buffers against disinformation and conspiracy theories. Uh, at the same time, we don't have a majoritarian voting system. We have a proportional voting system. Um, so the stakes seem to be at a first glance a little bit lower than in the US. At the same time, I think we are witnessing the, the negative externalities, so to say, the adverse impacts of, of uh, yeah, in my view, and I'm, regulated digital uh, media space because one very worrying trend we're observing in Germany is the silencing of, of political voices, especially silencing of women, uh, of uh, yeah, uh, vulnerable communities who are uh, systematically, unfortunately, as the polls as, or as uh, yeah, surveys show, who are systematically withdrawing from democratic debate, from public participation, because they can simply not uh, withstand um yeah the hate uh i think that's that's uh extremely scary and it concerns everyone also dominant populations but disproportionately so of course vulnerable communities and i think that is the biggest threat so to say to electoral integrity in germany this year we always like to talk about uh about Russian interference, about dark cyber forces uh, looking to uh, yeah, interfere. And that is an issue, but I think the far bigger issue that of course, like the tech lobbyists don't like to discuss so extensively is their lack of diligence and uh, ethical standards in, in, in yeah, keeping their services clean and safe for everyone, uh, a good uh, spot for, for civic engagement and civic discourse. So yeah, that's what really worries me. And then as we approach the elections, um, we'll have to see uh, whether we, we will be witnessing similar uh, footage as we saw on January 6th uh, when we, when there was actually like a violent insurrection in the US, we already had two attempts to, uh, during throughout the past years in Germany um, by aroused or yeah, violent mobs to, to storm our parliamentary building here as well, also fueled by conspiracy theories. Um, it was nothing to the extent we witnessed in the US, but I think this is something that our yeah, security authorities, but above all the platforms should prepare for in Germany as well. Thank you, thank you, Felix. Uh, and I and I really, um, you know, agree with this idea that you share that it's it's surprising that still the platforms are not doing the due diligence. They're also lacking transparency uh, about what they're uh, doing. Um, I, it reminds me that Mozilla actually presented a research at Mozfest this year into platform policies in the U.S. election, and uh, they highlighted the lack of transparency uh, as a real problem in seeing how effective policy changes. Are. And um, uh, another uh, was essentially that the platforms did too little, too late, just like you were uh, explaining to us uh, right now. Um, Julia, uh, given that one thing that stood out in particular was how reactive platforms were, uh, especially after the election, do you think they'll do the right thing this time uh, in Germany, especially with the, the backdrop of several regulations like the Digital Service Act? Uh, being negotiated at the EU level at the moment, uh, while the election is taking a cycle, sorry, is taking place. Mm, yeah. 
Um, first of all, um, the DSA is not law yet. It's only been proposed by the European Commission last December, and it's going to take a while until it's negotiated among the member states and the European Parliament and finally take effect. Who knows uh, when that will be? So it's possible that the perspective of having the DSA later on may influence platforms in a way already now. But my experience in general is that enforcement on, on the basis of a law that is already in effect is the only way a law is observed across the board. Um, well, I want to mention another interesting EU approach. Uh, apart from the DSA, um, the European Commission started an initiative back in 2018 uh, that encourages uh, social media companies to do more voluntarily to stop disinformation. And it is pre now preparing new guidance to strengthen this uh, code of practice on, on disinformation. By the way, our host Mozilla is a signatory of this code, um, along with companies that are more in the focus of the code, like um, Facebook, Google, Twitter, Microsoft, TikTok, um, and along with parts of the advertising industry. And, and um, this reinforced new guidance will be presented at the College of Commissioners uh, tomorrow in Brussels, May 26th. Of course, it's a purely self-regulatory approach. I'm generally pretty skeptical about that, uh, but it's a step and it includes quite a process with concrete commitments, reports. It's notable, you know, of course, that this update to the Code of Practice on Disinformation comes up now. Um, but you know, the general dilemma that the platforms find themselves in and uh, the reason for their reactiveness still persists uh, even after the, the more robust reactions in the US post January 6th. Um, although, I mean, maybe the platforms didn't actively look for that political power that but they effectively have it and it's a cash cow and they don't see, really see um, a good way of handling that that this uh, that is in line with democratic rules wherever they operate and of course many of them also operate in non-democratic countries so <laughs> rules about freedom of speech what is permissible in election campaigns are very much dependent on legal cultures and those are different uh, different in different nations um, tech platforms don't stop stop at na national borders community standards as they call them uh, cannot replace actual laws. Um, so to come back to your question, um, yes, the platforms are strengthening their measures to secure the elections. It's an arms race with hackers, foreign interference, etc. Felix mentioned it. In terms of content, it's difficult to say what the right thing is that the platforms should do because we expect clarity and consistency in their rules from them. They expect it from legislators because those ethical expectations clash with their business models. And uh, we need to make their business models compatible with what is the right thing to do. And, and that's a more fundamental question we need to tackle. Thank you, Julia. And we're, I'd like to uh, get to you now uh, and discuss one thing that's apparently uh, quickly is becoming apparent is, is that platforms themselves wield a lot of power. Uh, Mozilla was able to get some feedback from its community uh, in Germany and uh, supporters said that um, um, things like the big tech companies only think of their profits and not for the common good. So my question is, should platforms even have that level of power or is government re regulation the right way to go as Julia was uh, suggesting earlier? I mean, I think the... Uh... The truth of the matter is that platforms are that powerful and have been for a while. And I think since the 2016 election, uh, from when we started paying a lot of attention to the kind of power that platforms can wield or the kind of power that platforms can facilitate for other actors, uh, particularly in the business of democracy. Uh, we, I think in terms of the empirical kind of research that we have available, th there are broadly two kinds of, of, uh, of conclusions that we've been able to come at, right? One is, uh, you know, sort of taking up from uh, Eli Paris's book, Filter Bubble, seems to suggest that platforms uh, play a huge role in locking people into echo chambers and, uh, and the sort of idea of... of uh, you know, a kind of uh, online spaces create a form of deliberation, which is kind of like enclave deliberation and that engenders uh, homophily and that engenders 
making certain kinds of opinions more acute and accentuate them over a period of time. There's also some evidence which seems to suggest that that fear is uh, is slightly overrated in the sense that uh, there are studies which suggest that actually people who spend more time on traditional media are more in danger of being locked into uh, you know within specific political echo chambers. So, but, but what cannot be denied is that uh, you know the, you know to a to a large extent the kind of claims, uh, the kind of business claims that, that a company like SCL or Cambridge Analytica made might have also been a PR strategy. But what cannot be denied at this point is whether those claims are overblown or not. Platforms do play a significant role in intermediating our engagement with political discourse, right? And, and that uh, cannot be denied. And in terms of responding to it, also we've come at it in, in two different ways. There are There is the obvious uh, <clears throat> inclination towards more regulation. And we've seen, I think in the last few years itself, a few you know, interesting examples of it emerging from different parts of the country. So whether it was the, uh, the executive order in the US, uh, which uh, you know, leaned towards uh, looking at viewpoint-based discrimination leading to uh, platforms losing their safe harbor, or uh, we have similar kind of you know guidelines that have come out in India, which which are actually which have become applicable today, uh, and uh, or so so all of these steps also these countries also wield a fair bit of geopolitical power in Germany itself. We've seen the Net DG uh, regulation, and that also led to a lot of questions around free speech, around questions of necessity and proportionality. So the the fact that they do wield that sort of power is is undeniable. How to regulate that uh, remains very much an open question. And I, I'm also looking forward a lot to the DSA because I think that uh, the idea of regulating the, the market power that platforms have uh, rather than uh, you know, regulating uh, content itself, I think, I think there is some, some sense in approaching that because that's where uh, they derive their power from. Uh, but I think it's going to be a kind of long and interesting road in terms of how we go about the business of regulation. I don't think there are very clear answers. And across geographies and contexts, they will va vary a fair bit. Uh, I do think that the that in a lot of countries, particularly uh, countries which have questionable history around free speech, uh, more and more regulation is actually leading to, to counterproductive results for uh, free speech and also uh, in terms of extreme speech that already exists on these platforms. So I think we have to be cautious around that, but uh, the current state of affairs and the sort of very little uh, action that plan platforms have taken. So I think the 2020 elections in the US actually was perhaps an example of, of uh, the big tech platforms taking more responsibility than they have in some of the other elections. The 2019 elections in India, for instance, uh, you know, we have we see a short history of extremely piddling commitments made by the likes of Facebook and Twitter. Thank you, thank you, Amber. Um, Felix, uh, we mentioned the digital. Sorry, <laughs> we have a guest this morning. <laughs> we mentioned the Digital Services Act uh, earlier. Um, how could some of the proposed changes help with election integrity? You think? So Julie, that's a big question, um, of course. Um, sometimes my impression is, and I know that my, my colleague uh, Matthias who is a full on uh, regulation expert is listening and he will probably send me angry uh, signal messages if I um, say less than clever things now. But um, I, I believe that uh, regulation isn't actually as complex as we often make it seem and as we allow the platform lobby the tech lobby to construe it for us and to present it for us what i really love about the dsa proposal is that it reverses the burden of proof basically we are no longer trying to understand how algorithmic recommender systems work and how exactly platforms should do their job but we define clear public policy goals or rather harms and we 
tell the platforms that they need to address and mitigate those harms and how they do it is their own business. We're not going to be prescriptive in that regard, but that they, they have to prove um, that what they say they do is what they actually do and that they achieve the result that uh, democratic lawmakers have uh, prescribed for them, the outcome that uh, democratic lawmakers have prescribed for them. None of this works, however, and I think we're all familiar with this issue, if there is no uh, independent access to, to platform data to scrutinize uh, them as they execute on these public policy goals. I think this is like a major, um, hopefully uh, fruitful novelty of the DSA to, uh, to establish a full-on auditing regime that comes with mandatory access, uh, both for regulators, but also for researchers and the public at large to certain kinds of platform data. Details to be discussed, of course, but I think in terms of like paradigm and conceptual approach, regulation is not that tricky at all, at least uh, here for us in the EU. Um, I just want to like, add one thing and um, I have like I worked for the European Union myself before and I have uh, often witnessed this uh, approach or this tactic uh, by the platforms uh, platform lobby to lead us in what some have I think very wisely called the complexity trap to exactly make these things sound so tricky and complex that we should rather back off and leave it to them like to do whatever the hell they want basically and I think that's like a dangerous path <laughs> if we just give up in the face of perceived uh, complexity. And um, one investigation that I just want to mention that we we did here last week, it's very straightforward, but it showed that here in Germany, it's possible at any time to uh, use Facebook ads to target gay teenagers with conversion therapy ads, to target any kind of the population with electoral disinformation, to target um, anti-Semitic hate speech at, at right wing populist voters. There is no explanation for that. Uh, there is really no explanation for how Facebook after all of these years like could still allow that to happen. And I think the only explanation is that they are not forced currently by any legal uh, framework whatsoever to do their job diligently and to put the kinds of resources in place that they would need to have in place to enforce their own policies. Um, thank you. Thank you, Felix. It's interesting that we're, we're talking about AI. Julia, I wanted to get to you on that. Uh, AI-driven systems, uh, like recommendation systems, which Felix mentioned, are playing more and more a role in what people are seeing in their news feeds. So uh, does the proposed AI regulation by the EU um, deal, help deal with some of these problems uh, we are seeing? Yeah, thoughts? so... That's the regulatory draft that I've been working on for the past year, and I would say, well, partly. <laughs> um, the proposed AI regulation that was presented on April 21st um, only sets rules for uh, what the Commission considers high-risk uses of artificial intelligence. Um, it also bans a couple of uses, and that's a good thing. So certain areas of facial recognition, uh, recognition um, uh, social scoring and some other uh, uses of AI, um, but most uses will still remain unregulated and at least by this regulation. And then of course, governed by existing other rules like um, consumer protection, non-discrimination, product safety, liability that apply to AI systems just the same as to any other technology. Um, there are some aspects of the proposed regulation, again, it's just starting to be negotiated. It will take a long time until it will be um, law that could help the EU deal with challenges related to dis and misinformation. Um, that's, for example, that there has to be transparency around the use of AI systems, a way to better understand how they make assumptions, also to, to document and correct them. But there the question is, again, is it only internal documentation or is it available to, uh, to regulators or, or the general public? So um, that remains to be seen in the negotiation. Um, well, so I would say big tech remains practically unscathed under the draft AI Act. The regulation doesn't really treat the algorithms uh, used in social media or search as high risk. Um, it's possible that some algorithm uses in ad tracking or recommendation engines might be prohibited. 
um, because they would be considered ma manipulative or exploitative practices. Um, but this would take an assessment by a regulator to determine, and we're definitely not, not there yet. So, I mean, all in all, it's important to understand that the Commission sees all of these proposals as a package geared to making Europe fit for the digital age, as they call it. It's the Digital Services Act, the DSA, the Digital Markets Act, the DMA, that take aim at the behavior of US plat uh, platform giants. And that's probably why the, this draft AI Act is, has its focus somewhere else. Thank you. Um, since we are on the regulation discussion, Amber, I would like to, to get to you on that. You mentioned um, how, you know, legislation developed in the EU are influencing other countries. I wanted to have your opinion. Yesterday, Nick Clegg, the VP uh, for Global Affairs on Facebook, wrote an op-ed saying that the US should regulate. So it, it's interesting to see platforms, uh, and particularly that one, advocating for, for some, some sort of regulation. So I wanted to have your, your opinion on that and also ask you, what do you think uh, the global conversation on that regulation should be? Should there be a global conversation and what should it look like? Well, there definitely needs to be uh, a global conversation around regulation because uh, I think otherwise what we'll see is these platforms are, have community guidelines which exist globally. And when they implement the guidelines, uh, you know, in response to any takedown request or any complaint that they receive, they first refer to their guidelines and then the sort of municipal laws in, in the particular country. So there is a definite need for a, for a broader global conversation around this. So, so it's, it's quite interesting the, it's, and, and in fact, a bit ironic, the space that we find ourselves in. So for years, platforms have uh, escaped legal liability by uh, you know, positioning themselves as technology companies. So, you know, Facebook is uh, not, uh, you know, somebody in the business of ads, not in the business of, uh, you know, media distribution, but because they're a technology company, they're outside the purview of a lot of laws. Uber is not a, a transportation company, but a technology company. So what we've seen is a lot of technological circumvention of regulation in, across jurisdictions. And in a way, Political actors are reversing this. Now, we're also facing problems where which uh, a lot of it are political or sociopolitical problems around, let's say, incitement to violence, around uh, uh, you know, political campaigning laws, uh, political advertising laws. But it's also easier for political actors to now kind of turn the tables and term it as a technological problem and point fingers at the platform for for the entirety of it. So, so it's going to be a, a kind of you know, tug of war situation between the, the sort of might of political uh, you know, actors within their uh, jurisdictions and trying to flex their muscles and uh, the sort of broader power that, that you know, uh, larger platforms wield. In terms of where we go from here, it's uh, it's anybody's guess, but I, I I do think that a lot of these technological developments, a lot of these regulatory developments that are have that we're having in select countries are going to have a lot of influence because of the kind of geopolitical and soft power also that they wield. I would echo what Felix said because I think the the key thing that we need to look at is more public access to data, which is hoarded by platforms right now. Uh, Predictably, what's also happened is that in response to these problems, uh, even a lot of regulatory efforts have made platforms more conservative. I think, for instance, the only sort of big regulation that, that allows for research exception is within the GDPR, but that's also fairly narrowly tailored, or at least it has been interpreted to be narrowly tailored by platforms so far. So right now, we are also in a position of, in a way, legislating in the dark, because we only get glimpses of how these uh, data ecosystems work. And then we try to frame our regulations in response to that, which is, which is also fine. We've legislated in the dark for, uh, for decades now with regard to various things. But I do think that public access to platform data is uh, what we need to ensure through regulation with, and, and also providing a little more clarity to platforms and how they might do so. Uh, and I think that is what could perhaps lead to more meaningful regulation. 
Thank you, Amber, and I, I completely, completely share uh, this this uh, analysis that you, you shared with us. Um, Yulia, I'd like to uh, also rapidly get back to you and ask if you could talk about the technical side of the elections um, and compare, well, how Germany is performing uh, comparing to the US in that regard. Well, those are, I could add a thought or two about the comparison of the US elections in 2020 and the German elections that are coming up. And that's the, so from a technical side, I've, I've been a poll worker um, on a voluntary basis, of course, in Jam Germany and um, also for European elections many times. I've also observed uh, French national ex elections and now uh, lived through two US presidential campaigns and elections uh, here in the US. Um, so for my American friends, I, um, I find it really important to understand that, for instance, um, we don't use voting machines in Germany, but paper ballots. Um, voting machines were a huge issue in the U.S. elections, and uh, some hacker friends of mine have publicly de demonstrated for years already how vulnerable they are. Um, in Germany, um, on the other hand, the Federal Constitutional Court has judged in 2009 that the use of voting machines is unconstitutional um, because they don't allow the individual voter to transparently see and understand the voting process and how results are determined. So we make our cross on paper, we count those papers, we recount them if necessary. We feel pretty good about it. Um, also, uh, mail-in ballots, a huge issue in the US, of course, last year are a common thing in Germany. Uh, I mean, they, were, they are in the US as well, but I don't think, you know, they're, they're increasingly popular all over the world. And of course, for the pandemic, they're, they're vital for many people. Um, so in Germany, uh, you actually get a paper form when you elect, uh, receive your election notice to apply for a mail-in ballot if you want it to be sent it to you. And uh, those ballots have to arrive at the polling station by election day to be, be counted. So that part of the discussion in the US would not exist. So it's pretty clear. Um, I don't think anyone seriously puts that uh, system into question. And that's also a huge difference to, through, uh, to what we've been through here in the US last year. And of course, finally, in the US, um, what we could see in forensic studies of social media, it was the president, Donald Trump himself, who was at the origin of a huge part of misinformation around the elections. And um, we were in this really gross situation of an electoral system being actively fought against by one of the main candidates, um, the incumbent president. And um, all of that, and I hope Felix doesn't prove me wrong, is not the case in Germany right now. And I hope it won't be in the months to come. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, on, on that, I, I would like, since we're into comparisons, I was, I'm also very surprised how much as a political candidate one can invest in terms of ads uh, to target uh, audiences. I know in many European countries, this is not even possible. Uh, I'm thinking of, of France particularly. Um, and I wanted to, to have a, a you know, a short discussion on that, Felix, with you. Um, some of the feedback received by Mozilla before this panel uh, was around this issue. For instance, some one of the persons said tech companies should ban politicians from using targeted ad uh, or just buying ad in the run of the election, to the election, sorry. Uh, others uh, say, wrote that uh, algorithms, machine learning, uh, in, in social media and in the advertising should be examined more closely and made transparent. I mean, there is a discussion on this issue of uh, political ads. So I wanted to, to ask you, um, do, do you think that is a problem uh, in, in, in general? And, and uh, yes, well, how do you think, could, I mean, what, what do you think are, could be solutions? Could regulators be thinking about, uh, about these issues too? Um, Yes, your, your, your experience would help us here. So I think that is certainly a problem, of course. I think there uh, have to be clear rules on political campaigning, on paid political advertising in, uh, in a democratic process. But for once, I think uh, it's not the platforms who are to blame here. I think it's mostly um, 
yeah, democratic governments who have failed to adapt uh, campaign laws, uh, party finance laws to, yeah, the reality of digital campaigning. So while in Germany, for instance, um, canvassing or uh, uh, political ads on TV or on billboards on the streets is all very like rigidly and heavily regulated. Uh, there are no rules whatsoever for online ads. Uh, that is definitely problematic. So in Germany, uh, in most regions, you can start campaigning basically like until six weeks or even four weeks before election day. Whereas um, on Facebook or, or on YouTube or anywhere else, we saw paid political ads nine or 10 months now ahead of the elections, often containing, unfortunately, disinformation, defamatory speech against uh, particular candidates. Um, so yeah, I think here it is definitely for lawmakers to catch up. This is not something the EU can necessarily do alone though, because when it comes to campaign laws, we're really at the heart of national sovereignty. So this is something that every uh, European country, every EU member state will have to figure out for themselves, like how to define uh, political ads online, for instance. I think there's some, some human rights jurisdiction and whatnot, but it really needs to be fleshed out and detailed in the national policy arena. Sometimes in Germany, for instance, I think it's even for the subnational uh, domain. And I think the US is probably the best example. I think you have like uh, 8,000 different electoral systems basically in the US. Um, so this is something where we need to catch up. What I just, uh, as we do this, and the EU is definitely trying at least to uh, play the role of, uh, of a facilitator and catalyst in this, um, uh, by, by presenting also this European Democracy Action Plan, which contains initiatives on political ads, trying to get all member states to like uh, um, align a little bit their approaches, align their definitions. But one thing that um, in this process we have to be very sure of is not to let industry or private actors define these concepts for us, uh, what counts as paid political speech online, for instance. I don't think that uh, the stuff that you can buy on, on Facebook's like customer platform is the only way of, of paying for political speech and should there is therefore not the only thing that should be subject to any future transparency and oversight uh, mechanisms and rules. I mean, we all know these, like this Bloomberg example from the US, paid political influencers online. For instance, if I pay for like, or if I buy 10,000 uh, accounts or yeah, or buy fake, um, fake engagement on, on Facebook or Twitter to boost my so-called organic content, which may, can, may contain political message. Why should uh, this not count as paid political speech? So I think here the onus is definitely on lawmakers to catch up, but they should do so autonomously and in a yeah, well-measured and considered way. Thank you so much, uh, Felix, and, and thanks, uh, Julian Amber, for um, you know, the discussion, it's not over yet. We have some uh, great audience questions. Uh, I'm gonna ask them and, you know, you can, anyone who wants to jump in. The first one is from uh, Xavier Harding on, on Twitter, I think. What can regular people do to urge big tech companies to take elections more seriously? Amber, you wanna go ahead? I mean, I think the uh, it's it's very difficult uh, for regular people, but I think what uh, we need, and, and I think we need a kind of broader civil society movement around it also. Uh, what we need is greater digital literacy in terms of being able to identify uh, misinformation, being able to identify uh, media manipulation as, as it uh, occurs online. Uh, and I think when we are equipped uh, with, with those tools, uh, we are in a position to act on the basis of them. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's a very difficult uh, situation that we find ourselves in, even uh, as an interested, well-meaning citizen. Uh, it's extremely difficult, the kind of time, inclination and resources that you need to navigate uh, through this information, keep yourself abreast keep yourself informed is very difficult. But I, I, I think as we think of, of education, as we think of, of uh, digital literacy, uh, we have to look at, at media manipulation as, uh, as one of the more important growing problems online. And we need to educate people and equip them much better in being able to deal with it on an everyday basis. 
Can I add something to that? It's just complimentary. Um, yeah, I was also, you know, thinking about something that I noticed uh, coming up here last year in the US, you know, when we were bombarded with uh, misinformation also on a personal level. And um, I think what what struck me was really um, that it also it's also up to us individual users to address not to the general public, but to our friends or relatives who sent us um, stuff uh, to say clearly, um, you know, I have a different opinion, let me address my concerns. Uh, or do are you sure this is real? <laughs> um, and so I think this, you know, instead of withdrawing or just, um, you know, um, call or just, you know, uh, cutting off uh, um, relationships because other people, you know, follow uh, or forward uh, stuff that is just completely um, wrong. Um, I think it's important that we all use our civil courage also to just say, um, I don't think you're right here. Or can you tell me sources for this, you know? Felix, anything you'd like to add to that? On the, you know, how regular people, what they can do <laughs> to force big tech companies to do more in terms of election integrity. I'm sorry, uh, Julie, I have, I'm facing a few connection issues here. I, I was not listening, unfortunately, for the past few minutes because that was completely spaced out. Uh, I think what, um, well, it's kind of like romantic to expect uh, users to use like their power as a consumer change provider basically to signal their discontent but obviously the reason why we want to regulate also as the European Union is that consumers currently don't have that choice so basically the free market can't do its job and rectify uh, yeah platform or like company behavior that may run a um, uh, contra the, the public interest so um, I think rather than expecting users now to yeah to just go somewhere else, uh, what they could do is to uh, mobilize their own representative to push it higher on um, uh, on the agenda of elected officials of their governments and uh, send letters. Why not send a letter uh, by mail to your representative, call on them to do their job and regulate big tech? Thanks. Uh, well, what you're saying, Felix, on you know the, the burden placed on individuals rather than on the, the system, uh, reminds me of a project which uh, my organization, Internet Without Borders, we had probably 10 years ago. We we're crazy enough to think we could create a e-union, you know, for users whose rights were abused on by social media companies. And we actually created it when Facebook, uh, during Facebook, Facebook's IPO. So that was, uh, I think, I mean, it was a utopia a very long time ago. But yes, I do think there is a, a need for better protection, uh, obviously, of, of users and using legal means that are human rights, uh, you know, respect grounded, that's also very important. Uh, we have another question from the audience uh, from Jesse Keating, uh, who's asking, what is the best regulation from anywhere in the world, according to you, that you've seen supporting election integrity? Uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. Have you have you seen such thing? First of all, probably doesn't even exist. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Amber, do you want to you want to try? I mean, I, no, I, I don't have an answer to that question. But except to say that I don't think we've seen a lot of uh, electoral uh, reform and regulation. I don't think we've seen a lot of response to the specific problem uh, posed by social networking companies during election or uh, broadly, you know, in, in the sort of discourse of democracy. Uh, we are seeing, you know, uh, legislation that, that will uh, undoubtedly have an impact on, uh, <clears throat> on sort of the use of social media during elections. But I don't think we've seen so far a comprehensive or even a, a, you know, any kind of dedicated uh, effort to, to try to uh, respond to the specific aspect of the problem that's caused during elections. Uh, so, so I think that is also part of the problem. And like I was saying earlier, I think uh, 
a lot of it has to do with analog processes. It has to do with how political campaigning happens. It has to do with uh, <clears throat> the role of diffuse actors in being able to uh, <clears throat> to play proxy for uh, you know, political candidates, for instance. And uh, there is obviously uh, across the border a strong uh, you know, lack of political will in addressing that. And I think what's also happening, and I, I refer to to the to the example in in the twenty twenty elections where there were existing institutions established and robust institutions that the platforms could fall back on. But globally, what we're seeing across the board is democratic backsliding in in various jurisdictions, as as Nancy Bermier puts it. The, uh, we are seeing uh, institutions being uh, compromised. In, in several countries uh, across the world. Uh, and we're seeing the rise of sectarianism, racism, xenophobia, misogyny, and, and sexism. Uh, so I think that's also becoming harder because we don't have uh, in several countries strong, robust uh, p- political institutions that can hold the executive to account and can bring about these changes. So yeah, I mean it's a roundabout way of saying we don't have any uh, great examples, perhaps. Yeah, on, on that note, Amber, I, I think I, I I wanted to to discuss this also. We we tend to uh, to uh, you know explain how surprising it is that companies like you know Facebook and all these Twitter are still not prepared when it comes to elections. Um, but can we also talk about yeah, the lack of preparation of government themselves who suddenly discover one day that, you know, <laughs> a platform can be misused. Um, yeah, well, what, what, what's your take on that? How come it's only now that governments are finally, you know, dealing with some of the issues that many of us organizations have been highlighting, have been victims of too, because, uh, you know, whatever, the, all the dysfunctioning starts with the weakest, first of all, and the weakest community. So what... what how, how do we explain that government suddenly woke up, but too late? What's your opinion on that? Do you have one? <laughs> well, kind of I mean, an just... introductory comment to that. Uh, maybe the others have more substantial things to say about this, but I think it's also a realization that these these are new, not two separate worlds anymore. Uh, it's not like, you know, you have a real life with real institutions and things that go on uh, outside on the street or uh, in, in companies that are in homes. And, uh, and then you have a digital life where just people are there to entertain themselves or, you know, do whatever, but it's not relevant to the other life. And so I think, I mean, over the years now, we have a total merging of these worlds. And um, I think this took a while to, to you know, uh, to be realized by policymakers. <laughs> It sounds simple, but I think it's uh, it's quite considerable in terms of impact. Thank you, Julia. Anybody wants to add to to that? Um, I this also means uh, as a as a as a uh, as a consequence that, for example, for example, as a like as an insider, as somebody who wants to create violence, political violence or whatever, uh, you don't even have to go on the street. You don't have to like, you know, uh, fight with people on the streets. You don't have to carry signs and, you know, so people see you, you can stay at home uh, in front of your computer and still incite political violence. And I think that's a I mean, it sounds banal, but I think it's a huge shift in a way uh, for for radicalism. No, I I, I completely uh, completely agree with that. I think we're almost uh, at the uh, at the end of our of our conversation. Um, uh, there is one last you know question that I was hoping to ask. Um, in in your ideal world, what would you know? Good election integrity. I mean, election integrity respected by big tech platform would look like. What What is one one aspect you would you know focus your your efforts on in an in an ideal world? Julia, do you want to start? I think we're talking. <laughs> well, I mean, we've touched on it a couple of times, and um, 
uh, I, I think it's just, you know, uh, look at your existing voting rights and uh, election integrity and, you know, the rules that are already there, if they're there in the uh, in the um, respective country. But, in the you know, when we're talking about Germany now, I, I do think they are there uh, in theory, but they just have to be um, applied to the digital world. Um, Felix mentioned that earlier, and I think... Um, you know, look at those uh, rules and look at the the new reality of uh, of uh, social platforms, and with a straight eye, and don't get blurred by like you know other arguments or uh, just just think about the actual goal of your regulation and how it applies to this new form of communication, um, and then um, yeah update it and implement it. Thank you, Julia. Felix, anything to share about that? If you had, you know, one magic power and you could focus it on something to protect it. Oh, here. That would definitely be um, radical transparency. I don't think uh, democracy and electoral processes uh, even more can work without that ground level of transparency. We, it's not only about holding companies to account, it's about holding our representatives, political actors, political campaigns to account. And um, if this whole, if like all of civic discourse and like democratic will formation is sucked into a black box, I don't think that we can exercise our function of public scrutiny. So transparency, it would be. Thank you, Felix. Amber? I, mean, I, I think what lies at the heart of all this and, and the kind of market power that uh, platforms are able to wield is data. And I think what we need is, is, is much stricter regulation of data itself. We have uh, examples of, of, of robust data protection regulation in the world. We, we don't have a lot of great examples of uh, you know, of enforcement uh, of those regulations, which is extremely meaningful. So, I mean, most of, uh, you know, most of the sort of content targeting that happens online is based on, on some kind of data profiles that are created. And uh, that, is, that is possible because it is built into the, into the architectural design of, of these systems. And, and that is built into the business models right from the beginning. So I think that is where we need to start regulating. We need to make it much harder uh, to share and sell data in, 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 in the ways that we've seen in the last decade. And uh, we need to rest that control and, and make informed consent uh, much more meaningful and real. I think that's where, uh, for me, while a lot of problems have grown around that, for me, data still remains the central kind of question and the central regulatory issue to address. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think uh, we've reached uh, the top of the hour. So uh, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, you can catch more content like this over at foundation.mozilla.org. And also keep an eye on uh, social media at Mozilla on Twitter and Instagram, where we announce future dialogues and debate panels and post fun things too. <laughs> and remember to subscribe to the Most Fast newsletter. Special thanks to John Lloyd, to Audrey Hingle, Mark Walsh, Andy Koschendorfer, Zina Abi Asi, Mozilla, and our fantastic three panelists today. Thank you so much. I'm Julie Owono. I was so glad to moderate this conversation. Take care, everyone, and see you soon. Bye. Thank you.